Hey, happy Friday. Thanks for joining me. I'm Carla with Race to Walk, and it's time for our weekly Bible study. And today we are going to be going over Bill Dad's second response to Job and his discussion about justice and safety for the righteous versus the unrighteous. But before we get started, a little bit about this channel. Here we share good thoughts about good words. And on Fridays, I host a live Bible study on Instagram at Race to Walk, and then I publish two videos a week. I publish a replay of that Bible study as well as a video about books. So if you're interested in either of those things, be sure to like and subscribe and hit the bell for notifications so you can get updates about new videos. So this is part of our series of a study of the book of Job, and we've been going through it chapter by chapter. And if you'd like to see all of the studies done in the series, you can go to my website at raisetowalk.org forward slash Bible dash studies, and it will be a list for the book of Job. And you can just go through all of them from start to finish. Or if you have a question about a particular chapter um, or section and what that really means, um, then you can just go to that. It has a list of, you know, you can tell by the, the main page for the book of Job, which chapters are covered in which lesson. I would recommend watching or reading the information on the very first lesson, because I think it gives a context for the book of Job, just so we go into it with, you know, some understanding. Now today we're going over chapter 18, the last second response. Originally I was going to uh, combine chapter 19 with this, but when I got into it, it was 19 is the one where, you know, Job says, I know that my redeemer lives, lives and there's so much in that as like, no, this I'm just going to have to stick to chapter 18 for this lesson. So this may be a little bit shorter than what my lessons normally are, but but anyway, before we get started, let's just this, start this time with a prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for this time and for this day, Lord. And we thank you for your goodness and grace to us. We thank you that your Holy Spirit is our teacher and our guide. And we invite in the presence of your Holy Spirit. We, I plead the blood of Jesus over each person that listens. And I rebuke every single thing that raises itself up against the knowledge of you. Give us eyes that can see you clearly. Give us ears that can hear your voice. And give us a heart that is willing to seek after you. So... Chapter 18. Now, I've mentioned before that uh, the book of Job in general is hard to, a lot of times it's hard to understand. And a lot of times you'll see uh, teachers or pastors pick out certain segments and make some applications to it based on their own perspective and understanding. And I do think there are different layers of meaning to the, um, to scripture and that we can get different applications from them, but to make sure that we're getting the right understanding and the right application of it, I think it's important that we understand that there was a point, there, there was a point that the writer had and that whatever application that we take from it and interpretation from it, we, we can't, uh, go against what that original, it can't be in conflict with, with what that original intent is, right? It doesn't mean something completely opposite than what it did to begin with. And the other thing to remember about the book of Job is that there's a lot of debate about it. Um, part of it is because there's so much of it that is unique to um, the book of Job. The words, the phrases are unfamiliar. Uh, they don't have anything com to compare it to, to be able to get context. And so even within, we've, we've covered that in several of the less lessons, there's some, sometimes some very different interpretations about on how they portray a verse. And the thing about translations is that for somebody to translate from one language into the other, it's not just about knowing the meaning of words. They have to understand the message of the writer in the original language to be able to translate it accurately to the new, right? When you translate, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. So... That's one of the things. The other thing is that it's just, you know, it's an old book. I mean, there's debate about when it was written. Um, I covered it in the other lessons several times that I think it is actually the oldest book that it was actually written during the time of the patriarchs. And because of that, you know, that it really is an apologetic work to answer the problem of evil. Um, it's not an easy book. It's not an easy book to just like, okay, we're, you know, it's not like Esther where you're reading a story, you know, there's, you know, act one, act two, act three, and it follows an easy path. There's different forms of, um, literature here. There's narrative and then there's poetry. And for us in the West, 
I don't know about you, I think most of us have a problem with poetry because we have to sit and picture it, right? When that's what a poem does, it paints a picture. And so there's a lot of reasons that Job is hard for us, right? We are a culture where we have a lot of autonomy over our environment and our situation. We think we can control things. It's hard for us to even imagine a situation where not only do they not have, you know, autonomy over their health, um, but even over their situation in society, right? That you know, there were, it was common for, you know, these warlords to come and completely destroy and take over. The closest that we in the West have is seeing what happens in other countries. And still, we don't seem to quite grasp that for much of human history, that's, that's the way it's been. You know, having a society of law and order is that you can count on most of the time. I mean, there's always going to be corruption in it, but that we do put so much trust in that, that that's just not the way things have been. And so it's hard for us. It's hard for us to, you know, when we talk about God, most of the time, people, if you get into a discussion, people assume they, they, you know, there's this understanding that you're talking about God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? That if there's any conversation about a God who is 80% of the time, it's going to be, you're having a discussion about that, that God. Whereas in the time of Job, that wasn't it. There, there were tons of deities that, that people put their trust in. Um, each nation had their God. Individuals had gods. They, they believed that they were localized. They didn't really necessarily believe in this all powerful, just and loving God that, you know, that Job is actually, that we saw in the last lesson, that he was putting his trust in for vindication. He said, I know that there's a mediator that is pleading my case as, as one who pleads for a friend. That wasn't the common thing. We, even people who don't believe in God, that's their belief in if there was one, what he is like, right? But that wasn't, that wasn't the common understanding at the time of the book of Job. It, it just wasn't. But generally, that's not, that's not the understanding of what people believe gods were like at the time of Job. And so it's important to remember that as we go into and read this passage, that we have to kind of do our best. And it's hard to because, in, number one, we're immersed in our own culture, our own time, and our own perspective generally, and a lot of us don't have an understanding of what those times are like. So, but we have to do our best to try to enter in and see from that perspective before we can really understand what this writer is saying. And for all of those reasons, Job is a challenging book. It's also a challenging book because it's not quick and easy. There's not a quick fix or an easy answer. It is. It shows us what is going on in the spiritual realm, right? But there's also shows us what is going on. A lot of motivations in the human heart. It's it's a story of the spiritual journey of people going through a trial and also people on the outside looking in while they're you know, coming alongside somebody who is going through a trial. It's a tough. It's it's a challenging book. So chapter eighteen is build that second response to Job. We talked about in one of the first lessons that, um, you know, Job has a chiastic structure and there's three rounds of dialogue between Job and his friends. And this is the second one. Uh, it was kind of, the first round was kind of like, okay, okay, you know, maybe this is going on. And then Zophar in his response kind of just goes at Job. And then Eliphaz is in his next second response, He's just pretty much taking some low blows at Job. And I think we, we talked about, we see that there, that there was some pride in Eliaphaz's attitude towards Job, that Job wasn't willing to acknowledge that he was right. And now we're getting, and Job responds to each of these, and now we're getting into Bildad's response. So the, the first round of responses is basically the friends explaining what can bring on judgment. And all of these things, what they're saying, all of this is true. It's just that they didn't know the, all the circumstances, right? So... A life as a personal sin can bring judgment. Bildad said family sin can. And Zophar was, if you have uh, wrongdoing in your endeavors, this can bring it. 
Bill Dad also said that um, in his that first response, he said that, you know, if you're righteous, God will vindicate you. And he said, if you're righteous, your latter days will be greater than the former. So he's saying God is just and right. He had this good understanding about God. And he really, in a way, made a prophetic declaration over Job. Like, if you're righteous, this will happen, right? So there's kind of gotten to be this tension between the friends. And then Bildad comes in, and this is his second. You just kind of have to kind of read, keep this in mind. Like, when you're reading through it, like, imagine like, putting yourself in that place and what this what this back and forth is like. But this is chapter 8, 13, starting in verse 1. Then Bildad the Shuite answered and said, Consider then, and we will speak. Why are we counted as cattle? Why are we stupid in your sight? You who tear yourself up in anger, shall the earth be forsaken for you, or the rock be removed out of its place? So what Bildad is saying here is that there's a few things. He's just saying, like, you just think we're stupid that we don't know anything. And can the earth be forsaken, or the rock be moved for, from its place? So like these, this law and justice of God is the foundation, right? The foundation of the earth. And so do you think, he's saying, do you think things would be out of order? Which is a good point, right? But, you know, I think that when we're kind of seeing this, it's like, I think Bildad seems to be the most like gentle of the friends. Like it seems here he's trying to kind of mediate this disagreement. And as we covered in the first lesson on uh, his first response, so his name means loved by the master. And that he was a Shuite, who was a uh, descendant of Shua, who was a son of Katara and Abraham. Abraham and Sarah had been promised a son. And this is when their bodies were as good as dead. The promise came. The promised son came. But not only did Abraham have that promised son, but after Sarah died, he married Keturah. And they had six sons. So Bildad was, he was a living, walking example of the overwhelming goodness of God. Of God's love and care for us, of his, that he will keep his promises, right? Bildad was evidence of this, not just the fulfillment of the promise, but an overflowing abundance of the promise that came, even though it seemed like a very long time from when, God first gave that promise to Abraham to the time when it was fulfilled. So what he's saying in here is like, you know, judgment's fallen on Job, right? And he's like, you assume that we don't know, like you think we're stupid, that we don't know how things work. You know, this is just basically the order of the world is that God is just and the wicked will get what they deserve. This is the thing. A lot of what Bill that says is right. He just, he didn't know all the circumstances though, right? So, but let's just keep this in mind. This is back in verse five. Indeed, the light of the wicked is put out and the flame of his fire does not shine. The light is dark in his tent and his lamp above him is put out. So the wicked are walking in darkness because they aren't seeing the true light. They're putting their trust in their own works. And when they, we go our own way rather than following God's way, then we are following our own light, right? So this passage really reminded me of um, Matthew 6 and it's 22 through 23 and this is Jesus talking about light like what we think light is it says your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body when your eye is healthy your whole body is filled with light but when your eye is unhealthy your whole body is filled with darkness and if the light you think you have is actually darkness how deep that darkness is so sometimes we can think that we have the light, that we have this enlightened knowing that we are in the right, but our eye is bad because we're focused on the wrong thing. Now, this particular passage is given in the light of um, money. Actually, I'm going to read the whole chapter so we have the context for what Jesus is saying. But our eye can be bad if we have our focus and our trust in other things too, like, um, you know, our political leaders, which we see a lot today, or sometimes it's even our uh, people put it in like faith leaders or, you know, religious leaders. Our eye is supposed to be on Jesus. Our eye is supposed to be there. And if the pe these other people don't line up, we don't say, okay, this is right. 
because they're doing it. We keep our eye on Jesus because he sets the standard. And when our eye is on anything else, and when our standard is set by anything else, then our eye is bad. And our light is actually darkness. I'm going to go and I'm going to read verse um, or chapter 6 in Matthew, because I think it's important to like listen to this whole context here. So be careful not to display your righteousness merely to be seen by people. Otherwise, you will have no reward for your, from your Father in heaven. Thus, whenever you do charitable giving, do not blow a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in synagogues and on streets, so that the people will praise them. I tell you the truth, they have their reward. But when you do your giving, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your gift may be in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. So when we're giving, right, if we're just doing it because we want acknowledgement from other people or, you know, I, I see this locally here, a lot of people give because they want to manipulate and control a situation. They want to have power over um, what's going on. You know, it's fun, even if it's in a church, you're not going to get any re- blessing, reward or credit from God because you're doing it for your own selfish reasons, even if it's just donating to um and and just wanting people to know you donated you're getting your reward so if you're really truly doing it for god and let him reward you right okay so this is going down to now verse five whenever you pray do not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray while standing in the synagogues and on street corners so that people can see them truly i say to you they have their reward but whenever you pray Go into your inner room, close the door, and pray to your father in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, do not babble repetitiously like the Gentiles, because they think that by their many words they will be heard. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So pray this way. Our Father in heaven, may your name be honored. So his name, rather than our name, right? Which is what people are doing when they go for a show to the synagogues or churches or giving good donations and making a show of that. They're not doing it to bring honor to God. They're doing it to bring honor to themselves. Okay. May may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth and is, is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we ourselves have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And that is what is commonly known as the Lord's Prayer. Uh, some people say it should be known as the Disciples' Prayer. But this is Jesus telling us how to pray, right? So we should be focused on, is God giving the glory rather than us, right? Okay, verse 14. For if you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. So keep this in mind. And um, when we get to the end, this is a pretty significant verse to tie into Job, but we're not going to be there for a while. So this is just verse 18. This is a section on proper fasting. When you fast, do not look sullen like the hypocrites, for they make their faces unattractive so that people will see them fasting. I tell you the truth, they have their reward. And when you fast... Anoint your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others when you are fasting, but only to your father who is in secret. And the father who sees in secret will reward you. And then there's another section on lasting treasure. 19. Do not accumulate for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and devouring insects dis- destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but accumulate for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where moth and devouring insects do not destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. So we saw what happened with Job, right? It can all be taken away in an instant. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And I think before I continue on, I think that that is um, what really what is being shown here. Is his heart focused on all these things that he has, or does he truly truly seek after God. And this is, this is what is being evidenced in this book. 
Verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. If then your eye is healthy, your whole body will be filled with light. But if your eye is diseased, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? This was a different translation than the other one I first read. This particular one is in that translation. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And this is basically all about our orientation towards God versus the world, right? In this passage, he's saying, you know, there's all these people that are making a big show about being religious. They go and talk about their good deeds. They make a big deal about fasting. They tell everybody about how much money that they're giving. But God knows the heart. And he says, do these in secret so that you know that you don't get tempted by this adulation from or admiration from other people for doing these things. It's not just about, you know, somebody knows that you're doing a thing or donating a thing. It's not necessarily that that's bad. It's that there's always going to be that temptation, even if you're doing it for the right reason to begin with. If other people know and like, oh, wow, that's so awesome. You're great. You know, then there's this temptation to be chasing after that um, praise for man versus doing it for the glory of God. And I think that it's really important to remember that 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 Jesus' verse about that bad light is just smack dab in warning about money, right? And it's not saying that money is bad, but the love of money is. If that's our motivation and that's our goal, then anything can be excused for if it increases the bottom line, right? All kinds of evil will be excused. And people will call it pragmatism. It's not. It's just straight up evil. That's all that it is. It's darkness. I'm going to read the rest of this because this is a really strong passage about God's care and concern for us. And this is in verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will do, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't there more to life than food and more to the body than clothing. Look at the birds in the sky. They do not sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. Aren't you more valuable than they are? And which of you, by worrying, can add even one hour to his life? Think about how the flowers of the field grow. They do not work or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his glory was clothed like one of these. And if this, and if this is how God clothes the wild grass, which is here today, and tomorrow is tossed into the fire to heat the oven, won't he clothe you even more, you people of little faith? So then, don't worry saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the unconverted pursue these things, and your Heavenly Father knows you need them. But above all, pursue his kingdom and righteousness, and all these things, all these things that we need, they will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Today has enough trouble of its own. So what Jesus is saying is that there may be hard times, but we have to trust God through them and trust that he is a good God who loves and cares for us. And I think when we read in Matthew 6 that what uh, Jesus is saying, what Bildad has said in his responses, like in his first response in the beginning of this one, there's a lot of parallels there that God is good and he does care for those who seek after him. This is what Bildad said in his first response. But it makes me wonder, Did is this what Bildad was thinking? Did he think that Job was actually someone like who Jesus was describing in Matthew 6? Somebody, you know, Job had, had, was known as, a, known as a God-fearing man and a righteous man, just as these hypocrites that Jesus is, was describing in chapter 6 were known as that, Right? And Job was known to care for the poor and the needy and to give. And so maybe Bill Dad was saying, thinking that he was like the people in this, that Jesus is describing in the chapter that were just doing it for a show and that his heart was wrong. And so 
Job is sitting in here in completely devastated circumstances. This is where he's ending up, right? And this probably did look like the justice of God. And maybe Bill Dad was saying, okay, well, you know, you've, why do you think we're stupid? We, we see what's going on. We, we know what the justice and order of the world is, right? We believe that God is just. And so even though you seemed like this, this is where you are. So why, why are you saying that we're stupid? But the thing is, Bill Dad didn't know, was, didn't know the whole story, right? And so he made, what he was saying was actually true. It just wasn't specifically true in Job's case. So then Bildad continues on with the fate of the, the wicked. And I, you know, all of this is a really, really good and strong description. Verse seven, his strong steps are shortened and his own schemes throw him down for he is cast into a net by his own feet and he walks on the mesh. So there's a saying that, Man plans, God laughs, right? And that's not an actual verse, but it is a kind of a summary of an actual verse in Psalm 37, 12 to 13. And which is the wicked plot against the ungodly. They snarl at them in defiance, but the Lord just laughs. He sees their day of judgment coming. And so Bill then probably thought that, you know, as much as Job looked like a righteous man, that this was just his comeuppance and God bringing him down. Uh, because this is the thing. People, this is what happens. People, you know, plot and they scheme. And sometimes it seems like there's no recourse, that there's no, no justice, that they just get away with anything. They, they're not looking to God to save you. They're looking into their own wealth or their political alliances or, you know, their connections. And they think that they can just do what they want and nothing will happen. And so they're, that's what they're trusting in. So then Bildad describes what's going to be happening. And this is in verse 9. A trap seizes him by the heel. A snare, a snare lays a hold of him. A rope is hidden for him in the ground. A trap for him in the path. What Bildad is describing is that it's their very own plots and schemes that in the end brings them down. And I think we see this is, is true. And if you pay attention to these situations where there's this long corruption that seems to have gone unchecked, that most of the time it's because that person, that, that corruption, the person that's been doing all these wrong things, they overstep, they go too far. And it's something that they do themselves that exposes them. It's this little thing that just will unravel it all. And then they're called to account. And part of the reason for that, I think, is because God is just, and he is a creator of the world. And the world is founded on justice, order, and rightness. And so this truth and this rightness, it always rises up, right? This justice will triumph because that is God's nature and he is the creator and it doesn't matter how much we try to suppress that in the end justice will win verse 11 terrors frighten him on every side and chase him at his heels his strength is famished and calamity is ready for his stumbling it consumes a part of his skins of firstborn of death consumes his limbs so the net uh, translation translates this a little bit differently in verse 12, and I think it makes it a little bit more clear. So they translate it as calamity is hungry for him and misfortune is ready at his side. And the, the commentator in that Bible notes that the expression means that misfortune is right there to destroy him whenever there is an opportunity. And so, you know, this describes the condition of the wicked. They always have to look over their shoulder in fear, wondering when they're going to be found out. Um, they think they're getting away with it, but that wrong is actually consuming them internally, mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. It is, regardless of what they think they're getting away with, there will be justice. There will be consequences. And that's just here, because on the day of judgment, we'll, we'll all be called to account, right? Verse 14, he's torn from the tent in which he trusted and is brought to the king of tears. 
In his tent dwells that which is none of his. Sulfur is scattered over his habitation. So the wicked trusts in his own establishment, what he has done himself. And things that he've made, he's made, this is his tent. Um, but in the end, that's not going to save him. And this will, he will be removed. And the king of terrors, which according to the net commentary is death. So from the comment, this is a reference to death, the king of all terrors. Other identifications are made in the commentary, Smot, the guarded god of death, Nergal of the Babylonians, Malik of the Canaanites, the one to whom people sent emissaries. So all this is true, right? So we will all face death and no one will escape that. But the only way that we can escape is if we put our trust and our hope in the one who has conquered death. So this is verse 16. His roots dry up beneath and his branches wither above. His memory perishes from the earth and he has no name in the street. He's thrust from light into darkness and driven out of the world. He has no posterity or progeny among his people, no survivor where he used to live. They of the West are appalled at his day and horror seizes them of the East. Surely such are the dwellings of the unrighteous. Such is the place of him who knows not God. So in the end, everything that the unrighteous has worked for will be as nothing. And they won't be honored. They won't, they'll be without descendants. And the people who know who they are will be horrified, horrified by their end. So everything this Bill Man has been saying is, is true. You know, he, it is true. He did have a good understanding of God's righteousness and justice. And it is true that, you know, in the end, all will be called to account. And he was speaking about here that justice comes. But it wasn't true in Job's case. He was more going on in the situation than he knew. And so it's important that I think when we're going through a situation that is um, difficult, that we don't understand why, when it seems like we're like Job going against one thing after another, I think it's, it's important to remember that, you know, there can sometimes be cause. And uh, Job was someone who, you know, people talk about like keeping your accounts short, you know, like going and confessing your sins to God and Psalms 51, 10 through 12, create me a clean heart, O God, renew a loyal spirit within me. Don't banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. We have to continue to submit ourselves to God and ask him to point out anything that we need to confess. If there's something that we need to confess, just do it. But Job had been atoning for sins. He kept his account short. This is what we need to do. But he still ran into some stuff, even, even in spite of that. And so that can be true in our case too. Sometimes, sometimes there is a trial like Job's trial that we have to just continue to trust God through. And I also think that we need to remember that when we're on the outside looking in, that we don't know all the circumstances and that we need to just keep that in mind that you know, if we, if we think that, okay, there's some things here that brought this about, then this is a thing that we need to be taking to God in, on behalf of our friend, right? And saying, God, I, I think this is a problem. You know, if it is, you know, just, I'm not, I'm pleading on their behalf that you convict them of this and deliver them from this, that we need to be interceding on their behalf, that God delivers them from this darkness that they're in, right? So we can learn from both. But um, chapter 19 is a very, uh, I'll tell you what, I've been doing these these Bible studies, and this is going to be going through the end of the year. Um, this is not a Bible study that I would have chosen if I was just going for keyword volume, either on YouTube or in Google search, because I was sharing with somebody that there's a lot of searches for like one chapters one and two, 42, and, and 19 is another one because it's a really strong passage. But all the rest of the chapters, people really aren't interested in it. It's like, you know, they get really into the first couple chapters and then they fall off. And I, I think the reason is, is it's just not an easy book to get through. People are looking for summaries. Um, 
they want the cliff notes, but I don't think, I don't think you can get spiritual growth from cliff notes. You, you, you kind of have to go through it, I think. So anyway, next week is 19. Um, so far, I think it's going to be one lesson. I don't know. I haven't finished it yet, so it might even end up being two on, on that chapter just because there's just like so much in it. But anyway, that is chapter 18. So just a few thoughts before we wrap this up. Uh, when I started my website, race to walk um, back in 2013, actually, I didn't know what it was going to look like specifically. Um, I, for work, I write a lot for like other businesses and organizations, um, for their marketing and sometimes just, you know, on their websites and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm doing a lot of, it's not necessarily ghostwriting, but it's basically content, content writing, and content marketing. So, but it's, writing for and from the perspective of someone else. And at the time when I started my site, I was doing writing for an organization that um, had some different theological positions than I do, not like totally different, but it was just enough that it was, uh, it just wasn't, wasn't my position necessarily. And so when I started my site, I was like, I'm just gonna write whatever I want to write. Like, I'm not going to have any filter. This is just what I think. And, um, other than that, I really didn't know what it was going to look like. And I didn't, at the time when I started in 2013, I had no thoughts of, you know, going into, you know, a degree program in theology, um, wasn't even on my radar. Um, and then when I went into the politics program in 2015, you know, one of the professors said that the point of scriptures, the point of Christian scholarship is to support the church. And so that's what I see as the goal of Race to Walk is to, you know, really to support the church. And when I write, I write to Christians. If, you know, I, I, it's kind of interesting because I, I'll get um, contacts about prayer requests, you know, from Christians. But as far as questions, it's, it's interesting because I, I get more um, emails from atheists, which is totally fine. I'm more than happy to do that. And I really, I do try in my comments to um, in like YouTube comments. I, I do try to respond to that. It's just, again, it's kind of a time thing because you know, it's not just like a one-liner that you can respond to. Some of them really require like a more lengthy response than, you know, it just takes some time sometimes. So it's just trying to balance that. But it's interesting to me because I don't really consider my audience atheist, but if they get value from it and want to ask a question, that's awesome. I, I'm just, I'm really happy about that. I think that ties into, if we're really reflecting, if we as Christians are really reflecting, who Christ is, then people want to know more, right? So that's the point. And I hope that, um, I hope the study of Job really helps people think about, like, we need to look at ourselves. We need to look at ourselves in relation to the people around us. And then those relationships between us and God and how we are approaching God for those people around us, I think that Job deals with all of those fronts. But anyway, those are just some thoughts. And if, you know, if you'd like to support this ministry, you can go to my website, racewalk.org forward slash give. You know, every single bit like goes to help get things out a little faster. Like I have written versions I need to catch up on um, from past Bible studies. And there's some other things that need to go out that um, that, that support helps. So anyway, if you'd like to support in that way, awesome. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. And, but Anyway, let's just end this time with a prayer. Lord, I thank you so much for this time and for this day, Lord. And we thank you that you are a good God who loves us, who leads us into understanding, Lord. And just we thank you that you are pouring out your spirit of grace and supplication upon each one of us, that you're giving us your heart for other people, that you're giving us your perspective, and that we are able to see people through your eyes. I pray for the favor and blessing of God over each person that listens. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, that's enough for this week, and I'll see you next time. We are going to be going over Job 19, so you don't want to miss it. See you then.